Hi, it's Katrina. Number 10. Corsica. Corsica is perhaps most famous for being the birthplace of Napoleon Bonaparte, the French military leader and emperor. Corsica is an island in the Mediterranean with beautiful beaches and turquoise waters. Today, it is part of France, but throughout its very long history, it has been through a lot. Humans have inhabited the island since the Mesolithic era, and there is archaeological evidence dating back to at least 3000 BC. This small island was powerful, with standing stones and primitive monoliths. The island thrived until it was eventually colonized by the Greeks in 540 BC. The Greeks were seceded by the Romans, and in modern times, everyone fought over who owned the island, and they had wave after wave of invaders. The island suffered under the rule of various Mediterranean powers. The Republic of Genoa gained control in the year 1500, but France and Spain also wanted it. In 1729, the Corsicans had had enough, and they started a revolution for independence. With help from France, after 40 years of fighting, they were finally their own nation. Known as the Republic of Corsica, they chose Italian as their official language. Under Pasquale Paoli, the Republic was built on the foundations of democracy, liberty, and justice. The government and justice system were completely reformed, and women were allowed to vote. They created an army and began to expand throughout the Mediterranean. Nobody liked this, and Genoa kept trying to take back control. They sold their claim of the island to the French, and the French invaded. Pauli and his forces fled to Great Britain. Great Britain considered the island to be of vital national interest and supported the leader's return against the French. However, the efforts failed, and in 1796, just six years after becoming independent, the British withdrew and Napoleon moved his army into Corsica. They lost their independence, and Corsica has been a part of France ever since. There have been several movements to gain independence from France, and the Corsicans are still trying to maintain their Corsican heritage and language, just as they have for hundreds of years. Number 9. East Pakistan The story of Bangladesh, Pakistan, and India is wildly complex. To make it as simple as possible, the one thing to know is that Pakistan gained its independence as a country in 1947, after breaking apart from India, mostly because the region that we now know as Pakistan was majority Muslim, and the rest of India was Hindu. But when Pakistan gained independence in 1947, they became two separate Pakistans. There was West Pakistan, which we know today simply as Pakistan, and then there was East Pakistan, which we know today as Bangladesh. What's really interesting is that the two Pakistans were separated by northern India. There was a significant distance between them. East Pakistan was populated by the local Bengals who spoke Bengali. The refusal of East Pakistan to accept Bengali as a proper language during the years after the partition of 1947 resulted in a huge disparity between the ruling elite and the majority Bengali culture. In 1970, tensions got very serious. There was violence in 1971. Violence became war, and India eventually intervened and the Pakistani army surrendered. The estimated death toll during the years of conflict is somewhere between 300,000 and 3 million. When the fighting was over, East Pakistan was obliterated and Bangladesh was born. Now there are three separate countries, Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh. Number 8. Gran Colombia Gran Colombia once included almost every part of northern South America and many pieces of southern Central America. Gran Colombia was a series of states that formed a union between the years 1819 and 1831. The states that comprised Gran Colombia included modern-day Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Venezuela, Panama, northwest Brazil, and part of Guyana. It was basically the USSR of South America. At the time, they were referred to as the Republic of Colombia. But why was Gran Colombia formed in the first place? It was to help these places recover after the brutal war against the Spanish. This was all thanks to Simón Bolívar, who on any trip to South America you will see immortalized as a statue just about everywhere you look. Simón Bolívar, with help from the Venezuelan army, formed Gran Colombia to unify the territories in their fight for independence. Bolívar became the president and helped to protect the integrity of the territories by forcing out the remaining Spanish and combating British mercenaries. But just like every republic built on too many different countries, Gran Colombia eventually dissolved. All the individual states began desiring freedom for themselves. There was a huge conflict between Venezuela and Ecuador. Simón Bolívar made himself a dictator in 1830, and Gran Colombia dissolved the same year. It was fully gone by 1831, and New Granada, Ecuador, and Venezuela became independent. 
They eventually broke apart even more and formed the countries of Colombia and Panama. You can still see this story today when you look at these countries' flags. You will notice that almost all of them are quite similar in honor of their united past. Number 7. Burma Depending on which year you were born, you either know a certain Southeast Asian country as Burma or Myanmar. For generations, the country went by the name of Burma. This is because of the Burman ethnic group that has been dominant there for centuries. It wasn't until 1989, after the ruling junta brutally squashed a democratic uprising, that the leaders of the military changed the name of Burma to Myanmar. At the time, Burma was desperate to improve its image and gain international legitimacy. It had been brutalized and exploited by colonists for so long that it was in a real mess, ruled by an iron fist, and was extremely poor. The entire point of changing the name to Myanmar was to exclude all the ethnic minorities and the ethnic majority to create ethnic unity within the country. But what you might not know is that changing the name of the country did nothing inside of the country. According to PBS, in the Burmese language, Myanmar is the formal way of saying Burma. Basically, they only changed their name in English as a kind of illusion to get some attention from the outside world. It wasn't until the country began to practice democracy less than a decade ago that the world began to recognize Myanmar. In 2012, Barack Obama even visited the country, though he used Burma and Myanmar interchangeably. The country's name is still a hot topic. And since the junta uprising in 2021, things are just as violent and turbulent as they were in the 80s. Number 6. The Republic of Texas Texas has been one of the most interesting regions throughout the history of North America. As you probably already know, Native Americans lived in Texas for thousands of years in relative peace and harmony. Then the Spanish explorers showed up in 1519. They didn't really like Texas, so they ignored it until the 1680s, when the French eventually made their very own outpost there. This annoyed the Spanish, who hated the French and didn't want them anywhere near their territory, so they took some initiative to claim Texas as their own. Then came the War of Independence in 1829, in which Mexico finally pushed out Spain after hundreds of years of tyranny. Mexico took Texas at this point, but it didn't stay with Mexico for very long. Texas actually became its very own country in 1836, under the name the Republic of Texas. It wasn't until 1845 that they agreed to join the United States. Basically, Texas was its own country for about nine years. Texas then joined the Confederacy and tried to break away from the United States just 16 years later. They've always had an independent streak. The Confederacy lost the Civil War, as you know, and Texas reverted back into the United States, where it will probably stay. Fun fact, because six flags have flown over Texas in modern history, that's where the amusement park chain got its name when they began in Texas in 1961. Six flags. Number 5. Prussia Prussia came from the old Teutonic Knights of the 13th century, an order of medieval German crusaders. They conquered huge swaths of land and all the way until the 1900s were recognized as some of the most nationalistic and fearsome people around, with some seriously intense war politics. One of the reasons everyone was so happy to get rid of Prussia was so that they would never rise again. Prussia shaped the country of Germany as we know it today. Prussia began as a German state in 1525 southeast of the Baltic Sea. It gradually expanded its size thanks to what is historically known as one of the most ferocious and effective armies in European history. It eventually became the Kingdom of Prussia in 1701, with its capital then being moved to Berlin. The Kingdom of Prussia united all the principalities into the German Empire in 1871 thanks to Prussian Chancellor Otto von Bismarck. It was technically the German Empire, though the ruler was Prussian, and behind the scenes, the nation was still Prussia. But Prussia lost its foothold starting in the early 1900s. It was in 1918 that Prussia had its nobility abolished and the monarchy torn down. The Kingdom of Prussia was removed in that same year, and the free state of Prussia rose up in its place. But this was no longer a full kingdom. It was only a state inside of Germany, and it remained a state until 1933. They lost their independence and were completely obliterated after Germany lost the war in 1945 and was divided into Allied occupation zones. Number 4. The Ottoman Empire The Ottoman Empire at its height was enormous. It included Egypt, Greece, Turkey, Bulgaria, Hungary, Macedonia, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Romania, Palestine, and many parts of North Africa and Arabia. It was absolutely huge. The Ottoman Empire rose to power in 1299, 
thanks to Osman I, the leader of the Turkish tribes of Anatolia. The Ottoman Turks began expanding their territory. They conquered Constantinople and ended the reign of the Byzantine Empire, who had been ruling for 1,000 years. Constantinople was changed to Istanbul and became the capital of the Ottoman Empire. The empire reached its peak between 1520 and 1566 when it was ruled by Suleiman the Magnificent. There was a uniform system of law, the empire was bursting with arts and literature, and they had conquered much of Eastern Europe. But by the 1600s, the Ottoman Empire started losing their power over Europe. Europe had gotten quite strong during the Renaissance, and in 1683, the Battle of Vienna resulted in the Ottoman Turks starting a decline towards defeat. They lost Greece in 1830, Serbia and Bulgaria and Romania declared independence in 1878, and during the Balkan Wars of 1912 and 1913, the Ottoman Empire lost every single scrap of territory in Europe. Perhaps the most notorious thing the Ottoman Empire ever did was commit mass genocide in Armenia in 1915, when the Turkish leaders decided it would be a good idea to massacre every last Armenian in their empire. Scholarly records place the number killed at about 1.5 million. The Ottoman Empire officially fell in 1918 after being defeated in World War I. They never should have sided with Germany. The territories were divided between the winners of the war, it was no longer a country after 1922, and Turkey was declared a republic in 1923. Number 3. Dominion of Newfoundland Newfoundland is a small island in Canada. Today, it's a Canadian province. But on September 26, 1907, Edward VII gave the colony of Newfoundland the status of being an independent dominion inside of the British Empire. This was after Newfoundland proved to function with a responsible government since 1854. Newfoundland had an equal status as Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. What's really interesting is that Newfoundland and New Zealand became dominions, meaning their own countries, at the same time. The Prime Minister of New Zealand even sent a telegram to the Premier of Newfoundland wishing him all the best. But here's where things get a little sticky. The government of Newfoundland in 1934 voted to give up governing themselves to be ruled directly by London. This is something none of the other Dominions ever did. Then, just over 10 years later in 1949, Newfoundland was absorbed into Canada and became a province. Number 2. Hawaii Technically, Hawaii is an occupied island currently filled with foreign invaders. Hawaii may have become the 50th state of the United States of America in 1959, but the truth behind it is quite a bit more complicated than that. The island nation was originally settled by Polynesians in the 8th century. It was a collection of independently ruled islands that were united in 1810 under Kamehameha I. The monarchy ruled for 80 years until 1894, when Queen Liliua Kalani was forced to abdicate. Around that time, the United States started to get more and more interested in Hawaii because of its strategic location. It was an entryway into China, East India, and Asia in general. It was also perfect for a military base to protect the mainland and give warning before an enemy got too close. At the same time, sugar and tropical fruits like pineapple were a huge commodity worth billions. Slowly, military personnel and fruit corporations like Dole and sugar farmers began to take over, and they did not like the native monarchy. Racism ran rampant. In the 1800s, the U.S. was very concerned that Hawaii might fall into European hands, so they decided to encourage more and more American intervention. Their economies became very intertwined, and over the years, more and more treaties linked the two nations together. The people from the pineapple and sugar plantations got together and forced the queen's brother at gunpoint to sign a new constitution, reducing the rule of the monarchy and mandating that only people from certain ethnic groups and a certain amount of money could vote. When Queen Lili Uokalani moved to establish a stronger monarchy, Americans under the leadership of Samuel Dole deposed her in 1893. This is Dole from the Dole Food Company, whose cousins started the company. The planters encouraged by the U.S. government led a coup. American soldiers surrounded the royal palace, preventing the queen from leaving. Dole became the very first president of the Republic of Hawaii and encouraged the U.S. to annex the country. Things were quite rocky, but in 1898, there was a wave of nationalism that spread due to the Spanish-American War, and the president of the U.S., William McKinley, finally annexed Hawaii. Racial tensions and politics made the U.S. defer statehood for quite some time. Lili Uokalani was placed under house arrest and charged with treason. 
She eventually lived a quiet life until she died at age 79. In 1959, Hawaii became the 50th state under President Eisenhower. There are now many descendants of the royal family still around. Number 1. The Kingdom of Yam There is a kingdom that we barely even knew existed in the first place. Very little is known about the ancient African Kingdom of Yam, apart from a few Egyptian texts from the Old Kingdom. Most information comes from the autobiography of Harkuf, a series of writings that were found buried in a tomb. Harkuf was a governor from Upper Egypt during the 6th dynasty, about 4,300 years ago. The writings say that Harkuf traveled south to the kingdom of Yam a number of times to trade with them, and he returned with a variety of gifts for the Egyptian empire. During one trip, he came back with a group of warriors from Yam, who assisted the pharaoh in the war against the Asiatic sand dwellers and impress all those they served. Despite knowing that the kingdom existed, it's not clear where this kingdom was based, what they were like, or what happened to them. This former nation remains a mystery. Thanks for watching! If you are new here, be sure to hit that subscribe button before you leave, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!